Hello and welcome to The Rich Tradition. I'm Elizabeth Luard and for the past 25 years I have lived and brought up four children in surroundings just like these, rural and isolated, among people whose lives are dictated by such old-fashioned concepts as landscape, raw materials and traditional trade routes. The peasant tradition is above all transmitted orally and sensually. How do you translate into an instruction manual the smell of the breeze or the feel of the earth? or the changing moods of the moon. Learning at mother's knee, acquiring the principles of good husbandry at first hand is what peasant life is all about. An apprenticeship in taking care of your own backyard. The only way to survive if your environment is your livelihood and your way of life, not a business for profit. If we lend an ear however belatedly, to those whose way of life is the care of their own small patch, we might find some way of paying the massive environmental bills which are now landing on our doorsteps. A country wife knows whether the wild fungi she gathers in her woods have been affected by acid rain and will make sure her patch of sloes and wild berries are not over-harvested or harmed by the plucking. The inshore fishermen who live through the four seasons overlooking their own fishing grounds can tell us more about the subtle changes in fish stocks, the variations in seabird populations than any pelagic factory ship or government funded scientific study. A peasant farmer can tell you more about the behavior of a certain field which has been cropped by his family for generations than any soil analyst. He will still harvest his own olive tree and tend his particular patch of vines by hand, keeping an eye on the health of their leaves and the strength of their roots. The changing seasons bring different tasks, plowing, planting and harvest. The opening in the spring of the ice-bound northern fish ports. The great celebrations of the church, which echo the feasts of pre-Christian times. The smaller domestic celebrations of birth, and death. Over the next weeks, we are going to see the same pattern repeated all over Europe. The ingredients which make up the landscape will be different, but the principles which govern people's lives will be the same. Today we are on the beautiful Hebridean island of Mull, where I now have my home. The damp, warm climate means the beech woods round my cottage are full of fungi and I can recognize and gather about a dozen different varieties. I try to add one new one a year to my repertoire. This year, it's these angel's wings. They're good for texture in a stew. But chanterelle are my favorite, wonderfully fragrant. They're supposed to have a faint scent of apricots but I think that's more because of their beautiful colour. I think the Scots, above all, love their countryside and like to be out in all weathers, just as well as it rains rather a lot up here. And some more wild gathering. These shores are washed by the warm Gulf Stream and you can find all sorts of delicious shellfish. The most plentiful and easy to gather are mussels. That's a good bucketful for my supper. I've left the bucket under the waterfall overnight so the mussels can spit out their sand. We're lucky to have a good supply of drinking water. Even somewhere as damp as the Hebrides, availability of fresh spring water dictates where people build their dwellings. I'm a grass widow this week. My children are all away in the big city working and my husband Nicholas is off whitewater rafting in Africa. It gives me a bit of peace. 
Shellfish can stay alive for as long as they can hold water in their shells, which is why you discard the open ones. They just need bearding like that. These don't really matter. They're just little sort of barnacle things, and they just come off and drop in the bottom of the pot. And as long as you don't scoop out the liquid or you strain it off, it, it doesn't matter. Most of them are pretty clean. Mussels are a lovely crop. They're really very wild. You can hang a... When they're tiny, when they're just... They're called spat when they're very, very small. They're like little seeds. And the mussels release them and they swim around in the bay looking for something to hang on to. So if you just drop a rope down or put a pole in, they'll all cling to it and then grow. And a year or two years later, you've got a proper crop of mussels, all clean and fresh because they've been washed by the seawater. There are certain birds that like them, so if you're a bird watcher, you can always tell where there are going to be mussels in the bay by the birds that you see. I like to cook them very simply so that you get the flavour of them with a glass of water and some parsley. And they say that... Um, Parsley doesn't grow in a household, in, in the garden of a household, where the man is um, boss. So that means that um, my husband Nicholas is boss in this house. There's the living proof of it. And an onion. So parsley, an onion, glass of water, enough salt to make it more or less like seawater. It's very damp up here in the Hebrides, so the salt's always wet. That sort of thing. And then... Chopped onion. That's it. Put the water in the pot before it burns. There we go. Now that's really just opening mussels in seawater. Nothing complicated. Just a bit of parsley. And the onion. Look at that pretty bowl made by somebody on the island. Hair bells. the lid on, give them a quick shake, like popcorn, and let them go. And they'll all open in their own steam, and they'll be delicious. Take about five to eight minutes. You don't want to overcook these. Oh, lovely. What about that then? And they smell absolutely wonderful. All just, just fresh from the sea and wild. I mean, it's really a pretty good way to go shopping. And here's some more wild things. The mushrooms from my woods. These are the dried version of the bright yellow ones of the chanterelle. You see, you just throw them into a stew in the winter and they give a lovely flavor. Absolutely gorgeous, nice little fat one. There, that's a good balance. And we've got some oil heating. And there's the onion and garlic. And we'll get the mushrooms in. And a bit of parsley. And I'm going to get a bit of thyme to put in it because that grows here and I always put in whatever I can find. I never try never to transport anything apart from the olive oil, um, which I seem to take with me everywhere. But I really, I cook like this because I live here. Wherever I live, 
I will cook from the landscape, and the landscape dictates what my family and what I eat. This evening, we've been invited across the water to Alva to a Kaili, a party, a gathering to mark a domestic celebration, a wedding, a homecoming, even just an exchange of news. It's here that the Gallic language, its songs and music, the oral tradition, is kept alive. <laughs> As in Kemet College of Ishaan Och, I was from his Munja Husakar, and a rat and all, and a prayer and a scrive Thomas Kainball. For King Yere Gailtach Chase, at the Hawker Ishavalach, where Misha Ruchs a Kenny Yard, my yo Misha, no Harish. Prayer and Kemet Frekerach, Sanatisha, I was from Kinja Ganach, Kunglunshing Odang, Kunglunshing Kyal, a quarter soon your fat. Addie Macquarie and his wife Jessie are hill shepherds. Jessie has been a shepherd here all her life. She's the first woman to win the All Comers Highland Shepherding title. The sheep roam free and unfenced for miles, cropping the hill. When they have to be gathered for dosing or counting or lambing, the shepherd has a secret weapon, a well-trained dog. Marvellous to watch. It's all in the voice. Come back behind that! Get away, back. Bye, folks! Back at the Cayley, it's time for refreshment. Fruit dumpling is the star. This is how Chrissy makes hers. There are plain ones for every day, but this is the party version, enriched with currants and spices and treacle and sugar. 
popcorn or just things they have nowadays. Families. Chrissy dumps it in the cloth and ties it up with plenty of room to expand. It goes onto a saucer in the base of a pan of boiling water. The water has to stay on the boil for four hours. Meanwhile, we can throw up a quick batch of scones. It makes it makes ten more tender scones, isn't it? Well, I think so. Yeah. Um, sometimes the the very stiff mixture that gets rolled out. They need a hot oven for about 12 to 15 minutes. There we go. No flies on the hens. They know what's coming to them. A red rag to a hen means the leftovers from the baking. And they'll repay you with beautiful eggs for the next bake. Katrina Ferguson is famous for her light hand with the oat cakes. Dry ingredients. Like pastry. That's right. Where did you learn to make your oat cakes? From my mother. And she used she got this recipe from her mother. Yes. So it's been passed down. Katrina uses eight ounces of pinhead oatmeal, four ounces of self-raising flour, a level teaspoon of bicarbonate of soda, half a teaspoon of salt, a little sugar, and four ounces of margarine. And I don't use a cutter. I just um, cut them with a knife. I don't make them into very neat shapes. I just... Um, Oats are the staple grain of Europe's uplands. Northern yeah, Europe has a wide range of these griddle baked oat breads. My mother does it. They're not terribly dainty, but this was the way. They go in a medium oven for 10 to 15 minutes until they're dry. They crisp as they cool. Chrissy's scones are ready. This is the bread of the highlands, baked fresh every day. Don't they look gorgeous? Show me a Celt, and I'll show you a fine baker. Chrissy's famous for her fruit cakes too. These are for the Cayley. And this is a special treat, shortbread, made like Katrina's oat cakes, but using white flour and butter. We have homemade bramble and apple jelly for the scones. The dumpling's done its time, and it's looking beautiful. Now this is the part where I always say to myself, don't panic. Then, and you can never get the scissors out the screen. It comes out beautiful and round with no support. Mm -hmm. Look at do. that. Now, right. <coughs> Perfect dumpling. Right, we'll put it in the oven to get a skin on it. Thank you. Look at that, I saw that being made, you know. Mm. Lovely. Mm. That's it. One finger. Oh, do we? I didn't know that. No, no. There was a house in the, in the previous uh, uh, croft. And Duncan and Murad Cameron are crofters. A croft is not a cottage, but a small holding, providing a way of life as well as a livelihood for a family. And uh, you, you are your own boss, nobody to trouble you, unless your neighbours. It's quite a good life. It's a good healthy. It's a good healthy work. You work in the open air. The only thing you don't like is when the rain comes down in torrents. Otherwise, it's a, it's a good life. You're free and enjoying the fresh air, the sunshine, and the shower. 
And how big is your croft? What, have you, what does it consist of? It's uh, 20 acres of arable mm -hmm. and over 700 acres of uh, rough hill ground. And what about the arable? What do you have on the arable? Well, I grow corn, uh, oats and barley, mm -hmm. uh, turnips, kale, and we have the rises and all these different stages in the hay line. And um, tatties? Potatoes, oh yes, they're a must. <laughs> and they're a must with the haggis, Scotland's most famous meal. Now the average Scot can go down to the butcher and buy a haggis just like that, put it in a pot, cover it with cold water, bring it to the boil, allow it one quick belch, cover it, turn it down to simmer, and leave it for about 20 or 30 minutes, depending on the size of the haggis, and then it's ready to eat. If your butcher doesn't have a haggis, you can make your own in a pan without using the outside of it, which in the old days used to be a mutton stomach, and nowadays is more likely to be a beef intestine. The ingredients are actually really quite simple. Here's lamb's liver. We've got about, I suppose, eight ounces, maybe ten, and a couple of lamb's hearts, and maybe a bit of onion, just to give it some flavour and a bay leaf, a bit of pepper, that could be pepper grains, a bit of salt, and then cover this with water to a depth of about one finger so it's submerged. Simmer it for about half an hour because these are, these are lambs. If it was mutton, it would take considerably longer. And then you have meat and a broth. And what you need, too, is pinhead oatmeal, which is not the same as porridge oats. It's really roughly chopped oats. So if you can't get pinhead oatmeal, you can grind it roughly. And I've used this, which is just an old coffee grinder. See, quite lumpy. It comes out more like a risotto than, than porridge. Everything must be grated. Suet, the shepherd's butter. This is a sheet of kidney fat. I sometimes make a vegetarian version using butter instead of suet and mushrooms instead of meat. A sprinkle of the oatmeal to keep the suet from sticking. Plenty of onion. The grating means it cooks quickly. Broth and the meats are ready. So I'll take them out and put them in a cooler plate. Potatoes for mashing. Mashed potatoes are the essential accompaniment for haggis. The hearts have to be trimmed a little. And then the meats must be grated as well. You can do this in the Maggi mix, of course, but I rather like doing it like this. And onion and suet. And two handfuls of pinhead oatmeal and then maybe a little bit more and a little thyme I like it but not everybody does that and salt and the salt in the broth so you don't want to overdo it and lots of pepper I'm going to overdo the pepper. Into the pot. A 
enough broth just to wet it like that. Stir it over the heat until the broth is absorbed, about 20 minutes or so, and another 10 for it to fry a little. There we are, that's the pan haggis, bashed neeps, which is turnips, Swedish turnips, and um, bashed tatties that we saw being cooked before. My family likes their stuck a bit to the pan, their pan haggis, like a risotto that's stuck on the bottom. And then here we have the haggis boiled in its skin, and the exciting bit is when you cut into it and it splits open. And some people um, pour the whiskey in the haggis, but I like to pour the whiskey in myself. Good health. Thank you.